System 76 and Gnome have a slap fight, and Firefox counts to 60. Unwitting, winning, uh, unwitting crypto mining. Oh, snap. PGP has been cracked. And Gnome apparently hates executables. Well, Nautilus does. And we're going to talk about a custom OS that you might want to watch out for. And that's right, ladies and gentlemen. It's another great day for Linux, so let's go. And welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we're going to stop, take that midweek break, sit back, relax, and talk about some of the neat things going on in the world of open source. Um, ben Stone joined every week. Uh, that's Jill. You know her. You love her. She's in uh, L.A. and from Britannia, my cohort yeah. from Saturday nights, one page from Mateus. Uh, what's going on, everybody? Uh, Jill, you've been playing around with, what are you, are you trying to influence poor, innocent Unsuspecting <laughs> people, are you trying to recruit them into Linux? Is that what's going yes, on? Yes, I am. Oh, yes, no. I am. <laughs> well, actually, several months ago, before scale, I had given a talk at at Community Hack Night at Riot Games. It's a, it's a monthly meetup, and I talked about my love of Linux, scale, Linux Chicks LA, and promoted the LGCs as well. Right. <laughs> and um, at last Monday's, uh, this last Monday's uh, meetup. What was really awesome is a lot of people came up to me and they said, you know, they want to get wanted to get started in Lin in Linux into Linux because of my talk, and mm -hmm. that just made me feel really good. And there were two ladies and and several men who were just they 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 were intimidated by Linux until I gave my talk. So that was really really special. So mission accomplished. <laughs> good to hear. It's nice. For Nice news. Pedro, you apparently have done nothing because there's nothing in the notes. Uh, yeah, there, there was actually not much going on this week. It was uh, just a whole lot of work and kind of then coming back home and then work some more. Yeah, no, it's a uh, cost contention. It's uh, it's taking its toll on the interesting things I can say during this teeny tiny little segment. And don't worry, or did you get your um, invite to the wedding? Yeah, <laughs> it finally came in the mail. All yeah, right. I'm still not going. Oh man! <laughs> oh, so that. Over here. Um, <laughs> listen, I know somebody's going to type, buy a new tablet, then, because I'm about to talk about my Nexus 10 that I carry around, <laughs> and it's not uh, like um, well, the battery got poofy on it. I was like, oh man, this is my kitchen tablet. This is my media consumption tablet. So. I replaced the battery. It's still working, and it's really nice because I forgot that thing has a 9,000 milliamp battery in it that just goes for mm -hmm. days because I just did a drain test of it. Yeah, that takes about two days of regular use. So kind of happy about that. Ordered some new kit for the audio. I warned Pedro. I was like, hey, Pedro. Pedro's like, what's going on? It's like, I'm going to be experimenting with you <laughs> shortly. Upcoming. What else is new? And... Uh, <laughs> We got a new audio DAC <laughs> headed this way. It's going to be balanced XLR out, and we're going to be running some uh, tests on that. Uh, hopefully, by this time next week, we'll see how that works out. And if it does, we'll be buying one for Jill and uh, one for Discord, too. It's pretty neat. Aww. <laughs> pretty cool. Neat. Yeah, we got Aww. to do something with that uh, hundreds of dollar that we have laying around, but I, I think audio <laughs> audio upgrades from the $7 DACs that we've been using for years might oh, be in yeah. order. Might be <laughs> in order. Okay, let's get into the real business because we got some System 70 drama. Oh, yes. Yes, we do. It's uh, System 76 and GNOME had a bit of a slap fight. Well, at least one of the GNOME developers because the rest of the GNOME people have uh, already come out and said, yeah, that's like his opinion, man, so <laughs> don't put it on us. But yeah, uh, Richard Hughes, or uh, Hughesies, Hughesy? Something like that. Uh, however he calls himself on the internet, uh, he wrote a bit of an article, an inflammatory one at that, saying System76 in the LVFS. And TLDR, don't buy System76 hardware and expect to get firmware updates from LVFS. And uh, right at the bottom of the article, he says, you're better off buying, I don't know, a Dell XPS or something like that instead of System76. It's like, really? Really? That's the note you want to yeah. end on? So uh, the big issue here was that uh, System76 is, uh, they have Pop! OS which is their own uh, custom version of Ubuntu. And you can, when you buy a computer from them, you can uh, it defaults to Pop! OS, but you can pick regular Ubuntu uh, in some of the official spins. So it's uh, 
they were using in order to do like UEFI upgrades without having to go into UEFI itself and just using like a flash drive to load the uh, the new file, they wanted to let you do it from user land. And that's great. And uh, the way that GNOME handles it is v uh, via um, FWUPD or firmware update. And uh, LVFS, they have a bit of a shared infrastructure going on there. And uh, System76 tried to make use of it because, hey, it's a GNOME thing. We're using GNOME for Pop! OS. Might as well give it a try. And it didn't work for them. So they decided to go with something else. And, well, uh, they made a blog post about it back when they decided to do that. And after Richard Hughes had posted that particular GNOME blog post, System76 came out with a reply. And it said, look, yes, we are using AF uh, UEFI which is a proprietary tool, but it allows us to do what we want to do with no issues, with no freezing, with no basically uh, stopping any and all keyboard input. So yeah, we're going to be using that. And they did have a bit of a back and forth with Richard Hughes. And he basically said, yeah, what you guys want to do, uh, F the uh, firmware update and LVFS will not exactly cover that case so they went their own way and then that no uh that uh post uh, that blog post oh, on what i'm hearing no here is basically this was an internet slap but yes it was <laughs> yeah. okay i, I, I kind of put a bow on that that's what <laughs> everyone picked their teams there was team gnome and team system yeah. 76 and it's like okay mm -hmm. really i i i i'm i love to live in this future where things are going so well that we we can argue about stuff like this but you know, I agree with you. I mean, System76 wants to control the desktop to to the point of rolling their own distribution, which they mm -hmm. want to do that. They did that. It's a thing. They're going to be manufacturing their own systems. That's also a thing. Why is this a shock? I understand why they want to do it. They want to have control over it because, hey, man, what System76 is really selling at the end of the day is support. That's what mm -hmm. you're paying for. That's what you're paying the premium for. It's not... Yeah. For, really any i mean hardware and all that but that's the markup and it makes it a lot easier and they did make a very good point with the specter meltdown stuff like that they were able to get those patches out almost next day i'm like hey man we, we could have done that any other way jill you, you have some thoughts on this oh yeah i mean this this just proved to me that system 76 is fully committed to open software and open hardware they're even talking about um, doing um, open hardware on the BIOS and, um, you know, controlling the LEDs in the computer with a, a separate daughter board. And um, that's, that's, that's been their dream. And they're, that's what they want to do. It's awesome. <laughs> hmm. All right. Uh, what yeah. do we got coming up next? Uh, Firefox. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. yeah. So, so this is a huge release of uh F Firefox, uh, Firefox 6D Quantum. And um, for enterprise IT, they're going to be releasing two versions, Firefox Quantum Standard Rapid Release, which updates every six, week, six weeks, or Extended Support Release, which updates annually. And um, the big deal about this version is, is the security. Um, admins can block about config either by using group policy on Windows or a JSON file that works in Linux, Mac, or Windows. And actually, this is really huge in the Windows arena. Um, and it's, it's crucial for Firefox to gain stronghold in the Windows world where Microsoft Edge is primarily used for so-called security and used for <laughs> as seen as more secure. It never was, but... But uh, that's that's the rhetoric that they give a lot of the uh, the businesses and schools, and I'm a part of one that that believes that. <laughs> so, um, but um, it's also the first browser that's going to support WebAuth, which is um, a way to access access your websites without having to put a password in by using a YubiKey. And actually I have a YubiKey here um, that I use regularly. And um, that's, a, that's really awesome. 
And it's also going to get rid of the the extra space on the title bar. Thank goodness that's been fixed. That's that's been an annoyance in Linux for many years. <laughs> oh, okay, help me out here. Is this is, is my o OCD power just not active? I've never noticed extra space in the title bar. Oh. <laughs> well, that's because you weren't using Unity or GNOME. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, the really huge title yeah. bars. Those. Yes. <laughs> yes. I don't notice them because I'm using Flexbox or Window Baker, but they, they are a problem in, in Unity and GNOME. Okay. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, yeah, man. They're yeah. going to do the improved Web RTC audio uh, performance. That's going to yes. be great. One thing I noticed is a uh, new CSS engine for Android because uh, we can love Firefox all we want, but if we got to be honest with each other, it runs like junk on Android. Compared oh, yeah. To, yeah. yeah, it does. Yes. So yeah, it does. Uh, they do make a point <laughs> that users in um, the United States don't say just America because people in South America get angry. <laughs> uh, may now, may now see an occasionally sponsored story within pockets recommendations to which I'll say, uh, Pedro, correct me if I'm right. Um, I don't. I don't think this is a problem because nobody's ever used pockets. Nope, uh, and mm. it was actually a point of contention <laughs> when Firefox started to include pocket by default, and it's the first thing I do when I start up a fresh new uh, profile of the Fox is to disable pocket. Just get rid of it. I'm going to be perfectly honest <laughs> with you. I don't really know what it does. It's a place where you can uh, <laughs> not just bookmark, but actually save a locally cached copy of a website so you can go back and read it later. So it's like save for offline browsing? Yes. Yeah, yeah. But it's much more well integrated and it doesn't uh, require you to keep that HTML file or a specific bookmark for that. It, it's all there. It's all in the pocket, as it were. All right. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I found something that that was kind of interesting earlier this week. And me being me, got to be honest with you, it's like I, I can think of like six nefarious ways to use this. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's pseudo pair, a plugin for pseudo that requires another human to approve and monitor privileged pseudo sessions. This is, this is launch codes for mission critical systems. You can't just pseudo anything. It's got to be approved mm -hmm. and it sends it over. It's kind of neat how it works, isn't it, Pedro? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. the way it uh, it works is you have the, uh, the locally, uh, whatever local terminal session you're running, and the moment you run a pseudo command, it uh, requires authentication from someone else. Let's say you have another user. It could be on the same machine or it could be uh, on a machine over the network. And basically they post the, they, you can just copy paste uh, or if they type out the uh, authorization command, uh, not only will they let you run that pseudo command, but they will also get a live uh, copy of what you're doing in their own terminal. So whatever you're doing, they can see it. And it's, it could be a great teaching tool. Uh, I can see its usefulness, uh, basically just having like uh, a tutor or a teacher actually looking right, at what right. you're doing so you're without just, having to on, on a scale stare over your shoulder. 10 was your first thought teaching tool? Be honest no. with me, okay. No. <laughs> no, because the other thing that my brain went to was, uh, the very first thing that my brain went to was a uh, office gr uh, or workplace grief engine. Mm -hmm. It, you will mess yeah. <laughs> with your coworkers as much as you can when this is running. <laughs> you know, what was interesting about this is that it's used at Square, the company that mm -hmm. makes the uh, credit card uh, uh, adapters for phones. So that was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> But, but yeah, I, I basically called it pseudo times two because that's essentially what it is. Mm. You need two authorizations. <laughs> it is. I mean, if yeah. you have like mission critical <laughs> stuff, like the system that like Raspberry Pi system that dispenses beer at your place and, you know, you definitely want authorization so people don't like change anything in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like it. That's neat. I would never use it for the intended purpose, but don't worry. I'm not going to be in your work zone. Uh, <laughs> this next story has Pedro written all over it because for some reason, everyone is hyper excited 
about the project that this was originally based on. And I don't know why people are excited about that project, because it's possible to do with a tab in Chrome. It's got a bit more functionality than that. So um, You're right. Th this yes. actually blows up your desktop and annoys you directly. <laughs> It, yes, <laughs> it does that too. But uh, the thing about KDE Connect, uh, at least for me, the big ones are being able to reply to text. You get a text and it shows you the notification. If, if you hit the reply button, it lets you reply to the text without having to go across the room because your phone is charging on the other side of the room. And you can just reply right there from your keyboard. Uh, it also lets you KDE Connect, that is. Uh, it also lets you... Um, Basically, whenever you get a call, whichever uh, media player you're using will pause and you'll think, okay, what happened? Why is my box frozen? And then the phone will start ringing. It's like, oh, thanks, KD Connect. Appreciate it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so GNOME people were uh, a bit dissatisfied with the state of the uh, KD Connect indicator and especially the fact that it had to download the kitchen sink mm -hmm. uh, trademark yeah. <laughs> uh, just to get it to work, to be able to even use its basic functionality, be it the notifications, being able to browse the device, what have you. Well, not anymore, because now GS Connect is now a default uh, or will be a default as of Ubuntu 18.10. GS Connect is, of course, the GNOME implementation of KDE Connect, and it should give you the same functionality, should being the operative word there, uh, without having to download the kitchen sink. Hmm. So you can look forward to 18.10 having annoying desktop notifications. Uh, <laughs> if you sync it up with your phone, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we talked about this a few weeks ago. <laughs> if I sync it uh, up with my phone, yeah. why don't I just use my <laughs> phone? Because it's a, I would much prefer to reply to text using my keyboard than using touchscreen. <laughs> just, just do it with like Gmail, man. You just hit reply. <laughs> <laughs> it sends it. Uh, that's a it's a nice addition to Cosmic Kettlefish. It, it's a neat thing. This, this is one of those, um, definitely one of those projects that's like, hey, man, I don't get it, but I'm glad that other people enjoy it. And that's cool. Just be like, hey, man, I like it. And we're cool. No issues there. I, yeah. You, you've seen my desktop. This Stuff like this is not allowed. On, no. Spartan is uh, yeah. maybe putting a little bit too much flourish on Ven's desktop. Functional. <laughs> okay, we we're talking about Ubuntu, so let, let's talk about a small fire that uh, sprung up earlier this week. Teeny tiny. A little bit. Uh, this comes from R Linux. All this business is going to be in our show notes. Come check those out after the fact. But caution, um, there's a fire right here in River City. The, the, uh, of course, this is Reddit, Owlbrain. The R malware snaps in Humbuntu Snap Store, which, yeah, some snaps, probably all of uh, Nicholas Tombs contains miner. Uh, this is the content of, all right, there's a crypto miner. It mm -hmm. was in a snap in a snap store. And that's not the beginning of a weird song. Now, Humbuntu came back and they're like, whoa, okay, we found this. This is a real thing. It's not making it up. And they wrote a little thing on their blog. Kind of uh, or evil, naive, or interesting. It's evil. It's evil, canonical. Why are we uh -huh. having this conversation? And they're talking about a bunch of things. Now, at first, at first, my first thought was, that took longer than expected because I'm, I'm not picking <laughs> on snaps because this could happen with an app image. This could happen with a flat pack. You, you have all the dependencies, whatever program it is, you got everything right there. And I, for one, was not surprised by this. It's like, yeah, all right, that, that was bound to happen. What I don't like is uh, Canonical's response. It's just the way it's worded. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, well, you see, check this out. The, mm -hmm. the, the gentleman who put crypto mining software and didn't tell anyone into the Snap Store He's just trying to make a couple extra bucks. He, he wasn't really doing it. I mean, we, we got to look at whether or not that's really even evil. Seriously? I I, mean, I can see them uh, trying to ameliorate the situation to if this for some reason catches fire and it 
the fire is directed at them, they are hoping that ameliorating the situation right now is probably going to quell those flames early. Uh, I think it had quite the opposite effect because uh, yeah. Yeah. that mm-hmm. a lot of people, I, I'm not the only one. This is not a, a hot take from me just being grumpy like I normally am. This, because they, they dance around. They, they never call it what it is. It's malware. Mm-hmm. It yeah. is malware. I mean, just <laughs> canonical. It's malware. Just be like, yo, this is malware. If you walked out, be like, yeah, we nope this. And they didn't even say in the blog, like, this guy's permanently banned. Let's make an example of him. 100% behind that. They didn't do that. And I, it was kind of, it just came across to me as it's being framed of, hey, you know, uh, open source. It, this guy didn't develop anything. He just packaged a snap mm-hmm. and shoved some crypto mining software. And he's like, he's just trying to make a couple of extra bucks, guys. I mean, is that so yeah. bad? Yes, it is. It is <laughs> it is. 100%. Not acceptable. <laughs> and... um that blog post just really read like, you yeah. know, th- this could very well happen again. And there's currently no protections in place that will stop it. Uh, mm-hmm. Joe. Yeah. So, you know, of course, one of the main reasons that Linux puts files in different directories is for security reasons. And again, like Vin said, I'm actually surprised it hasn't happened sooner. This has been a problem with self-contained apps for Windows for many, many years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, many years. And, um, you know, it's just, it, it was bound to happen. And I remember when even Shuttleworth was talking about snaps. I was thinking that when I was listening to his talk. I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> malware. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And you actually bring and, up a really um, good point. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> if there's any question as to the maliciousness of this uh, particular crypto jacking attack in these snaps, because there was more than one, um, is that the developer was a, not only aware of it, he actively tried to dissimulate uh, the software as System D. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. System D, <laughs> exactly. one of the most intrusive uh, bits of uh, software ever created for Linux, according to some people. Yes. According to other people, it's actually mm-hmm. a moderately all right in its system. But the fact of the matter is, it is under a lot of scrutiny. And I, I, the people I'm who. Sorry, <laughs> somebody just started writing that hate mail after listening yeah. to the first part of it, and they get like half a sentence, and they're like, but he defended it too. No. Uh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when I was reading. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's really. <laughs> It's malware. Just call it for what yeah. it is. And even if it's not getting access to your personal files because Snaps, uh, SnapD as a container uh, containerizing system. Ooh, I t- bumped the microphone. I apologize. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, uh, uh, it also um, still uses your hardware. It still uh, works as a native application would when it comes to your hardware. That level of abstraction only stops it from accessing the rest of your system. You're still yeah. basically powering this person's crypto mining operation. No. That's no. <laughs> um, not the first time we've yeah. seen a Bitcoin miner hiding in an application, Pedro. No, no, it isn't. <laughs> I mean, it's a dangerous game of chess, one might say. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm, why do you need at least eight threads to even start a chess game? Oh, it's a, it's AI, bro. It's AI. Uh, now, admittedly, this was so. This is years ago. Um, we, yeah, we were a gaming like show. Five, five years, years ago? It was so long ago that it was still feasible to mine Bitcoin with CPUs. Mm-hmm. So. But yeah, it's the AI. Yeah. It's the complex math. No, it isn't. Joel, do you get any extra thoughts on this? <laughs> no, we pretty much covered it. But yeah, the the Linux Journal um, definitely they they kept kept talking about how it's masquerading as a system D package, and that's scary. <laughs> like mm-hmm. Pedro was saying, <laughs> mm-hmm. as if system D wasn't bad enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coming up next, PGP failed. This is this got a lot of attention, and I was like, a lot, a lot, a lot of y'all just posers. Because let, let, let I mean, let's be honest with each other. We all know what PGP is. It's the thing everyone knows about, talks about. Don't nobody use it. Um, <laughs> this is also a thing, man. There wasn't. Who's this from? This is from EFF directly from them. 
there was an issue with implementation of it with certain clients. There's not a problem with PGP mm -hmm. itself. And the biggest thing that it was dealing with was a, the like Thunderbird and a couple other had some issues, but it was HTML markup and stuff like that, to which I immediately thought, okay, it, why, why in the world of worlds would uh, there be any reason to send an email that was worth encrypting to this point that that's that important? <laughs> why would it include HTML or any other type of rich formatting in the first place? That, yeah, mm, question. It doesn't. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> It just doesn't. And if uh, one of the things that they brought up when uh, PGP is like, oh, PGP, when used with certain clients, will like Enigmail for uh, Thunderbird and whatnot, it's, um, it's, uh, it's actually leaking your uh, encrypted message. <laughs> I just love uh, the response. It's like, one, the paper is misnamed. Uh, two, the yep. attack targets buggy email clients. The authors of the paper... Basically, mm. this is what he's saying, but I like the way I said it better. The authors just made a list of buggy email clients. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And, and they lopped in GPG, which is the uh, GNU version of uh, PGP. And it's like, oh, so GPG isn't as vulnerable as <laughs> PGP. And like most of the mainstream media was trying to get everyone to believe it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Okay. I even saw an article that said, oh, use Signal instead. Uh, there's been a bug discovered with that one, too. Because, hey, guess what? That uses S-MIME. <laughs> you know what else was uh, <laughs> uh, cracked <laughs> along with PGP? S-MIME. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Terrified, Jill. Uh. Yeah. Well, Semantic was just trying to, to, to spread the bad press about mm -hmm. EPG. <laughs> but, but this is actually scary and it's kind of one of the reasons why i don't don't use a uh, pretty good privacy because it really isn't hmm. and, uh, and and you know it's had it's had issues over the years um but um this is definitely the efail vulnerability for sure <laughs> i mean i for one welcome our black helicopter overlords and i, I like the bows yeah. like the authors have done the community a good service by cataloging buggy mm -hmm. email clients we're grateful to them for that yeah. we do wish though this had been handled with a little less hype, but that is so hard to do in 2018, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm. A whole lot yeah. of people got scared for very yeah. little. Um, 2018. Yeah. Let's go back to 2013 when Heartbleed came out. Mm. Remember that? Oh, yeah. And that was an actual vulnerability, though. <laughs> it was, but it was completely blown out of proportion. <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> So let, let's go from scary to this isn't even terrifying because um, you might be terrified at first when you think about this, but the more you think uh, about it, it, it seems kind of sad. We're talking about GNOME removing the ability to launch uh, binary apps <laughs> from Nautilus. No, this is not April 1st, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Lo and behold, that does sound like something for that date. <laughs> Yeah, this is no joke. I mean, I'm genuinely yeah. convinced at this point. I am 100% convinced that GNOME developers are actively trolling the community just to see. It's like, let, yeah. let, let's see if we can get away with doing this. <laughs> um, if you're thinking, it's like, okay, you open Nautilus, say you want to open just any executable in there. Mm -mm. Nope, not going to happen. Like, oh, why would I do that? App images. There's a good use right there. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -mm, it's not going to happen. Program shortcuts. Nope. Scripts. Mm-mm. Why are they making this change? Oh man, if somebody had a decrypted trod for why GNOME does stuff. Uh, to me, I kind of feel like this is a good example of what happens when a team, de their design focus is aimed at like potential users down the road and at the same time ignoring the people who actually use their product. Um, yeah. <laughs> but their solution is you can still run the binary apps yeah, you can. And the solution is like, just open up a terminal, bro. Yep. Yeah, because uh, that's easier yeah. than double clicking in it, no. Yep. <laughs> Joke. Yeah, this is so, this is just was really annoyed me. You know, my first reaction on reading this article is what the heck? Because um, I use this functionality all the time in all my file managers. And do you mean I have to remember not to use Nautilus to launch, launch app images and scripts, et cetera? Um, and there are those of us who don't use the known desktop who like to use 
not the Nautilus file manager <laughs> to manage their files. And I'm I'm one. I use it under Flexbox and Window Maker and XFCE. So they're they're completely de denying us access with their file manager. <laughs> even well, even there is that other, argument though. You know? I mean, you can use what you want. <laughs> I mean, yes, you can use what you want, but Nautilus, yeah. as long outlived its prime time, uh, you want to use something that gives you the same functionality. Well, come on, and let's be honest. More. It's not like Dolphin is the new hotness. No, yeah. no, no. Dolphin, <laughs> Dolphin is a bloated mess at this point that needs to be looked at. I'll be actually talking about Nemo, the cinnamon yeah. fork, or Kaja, the uh, yeah. mate fork. You're just making so, up words. <laughs> no, uh, those two will actually give you basically the exact same functionality or more functionality yeah. now uh, mm -hmm. out of the box. And Nautilus, Nautilus isn't even the first uh, file manager to do this. Um, I think it was Thunar that didn't yes. uh, let you run SH scripts by default, but you could just change one of the options. You just changed it and it looks... well. Now you double click and it gives you the option to either run it, view the text, or whatever. Okay. So all right, all right. yeah, it's I, I'm going yeah. to try to yeah. play Flying Spaghetti Monsters advocate on this. Um <laughs> it's, <laughs> mental gymnastics, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Good luck. Um, <laughs> what if the argument is a file manager should do one thing and that's manage files it's not there to launch stuff <laughs> is that such a crazy idea it's not such a crazy idea but how are you gonna launch stuff if you're looking for a specific file chances are you're going to have the file manager open and if that file happens to be an application and you want to run it do you have to start a separate app or right click open a terminal just to launch it when it was expected functionality up until now that you just double click it and it launches. Well, people hate yeah. change and that's one thing that will <laughs> never change. Yeah. Um, it's not a big deal. I, ultimately, I think mean, this is overhyped too. Yeah, it, it's... <laughs> it to, is. To most people, uh, it, it does yeah. it did make a lot of people take pause and look a bit sideways and go, really? We're going? We're, yeah. we're doing that? Okay. <laughs> That's well, truthfully, you know, a lot of us Linux users use file managers as, you know, our Swiss Army knife. And I, for one, do. I I, I actually yep. use PC, um, um, uh, ManFM and um, um, MLFM as well um, because, because of that power. I like to have more control. But I use Nautilus a lot, too, to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I can think of a lot of Nautilus. stuff I actually launch. I use Thuna. <laughs> My first reaction... To basically launching everything is right click open terminal. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, don't even know if that would affect me. All right. Yeah, it's expected functionality yeah. that was already there and now it's gone. Yeah. That's the issue. Yeah. Here. Pray they do That's not the alter yeah, the exactly. rules further. Um, <laughs> Asteroid OS. That's right. Uh, it's thing 1.0. It's out, man. Uh, the, four years ago, this dude envisioned an open source operating system for smartwatches. And now we have the uh, first point release of his project. And it's there. It's out. Bunch of cool things in the release. I think you want to tell me about it, man. All this hot stuff. It's a, yeah, it's a, a dedicated operating system that's not just like Android Wear. That's just a, basically an add-on to whichever Android-enabled device you happen to have. This one is a dedicated operating system that runs on your smartwatch. And uh, they already support, uh, let's see, one, eight. two, three, four, eight, yes. <laughs> uh, eight uh, different devices. Uh, it's... The common ones, DLG, G-Watch, the Sony SmartWatch 3, the Asus Zen Watch, uh, basically all the variations of the Asus Zen Watch. And yeah, it's um, one of the things that they are still uh, Pedro, trying to work on. You can finally SSH into your watch. I mean, it's every, <laughs> every little boy's dream come true. <laughs> yeah, that uh, kind of neatly ties into the point I was going to make, because it's a full-blown operating system running on your watch. Mm -hmm. See, uh, for all the criticism and for all the issues that I could lever uh, leverage at uh, Android Wear, mostly it just being an add-on and not mm -hmm. doing much on its own, 
I think that going full on dedicated operating system for that platform is not exactly the right way because yes, you can SSH into your watch, but hey, guess what? Now it's also open to a gang of other different things which were, for better or worse, locked away inside Android Wear. So I don't know, it, it feels like they may have, um, well, they didn't so much as stick the landing as they completely missed it and landed on the next galaxy over. <laughs> oh, pl- mm. All right. All right. Seriously. A uh, couple of things with this. Yeah, it runs on, uh, correctly, seven watches, not eight, uh, mm-hmm. but they showed eight. Wayland. This uses Wayland. I love that. That makes mm-hmm. me happy. Um, it also <laughs> takes years of Pulse Audio. So you win some, you lose some on that. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Something that was really neat in the documentation, you can dual boot if you don't want to get rid of your original Android OS. Uh, that's the thing. I thought that was really neat. Yeah. For me, not a fan of wrist jewelry. And if you're wearing wristwatches in 2018 outside of like some wicked specialized use cases, it's it's jewelry. All right. Just, just sell it to yourself like that. <laughs> There's no smartness yeah. here. It's just a wristwatch. <laughs> I don't need another thing to charge up. Plus, I firmly believe that clocks are an invention. I, I, like, I always say invention by the Swiss, even though it's like, oh, the Chinese invented it. Yes, I know that, but it sounds better when you say the Swiss uh, for people with lazy minds, because I always kind of know what time it is. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, it is nice that there's uh, another um, uh, version of Linux in, in this space. Actually, several years ago, WebOS, uh, there was going to be a WebOS watch OS, and it never took off, unfortunately. But it, it's it's nice to see another contender other than Android and iOS in this space. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, listen, I, I'm completely yeah. I, for the first release of this. This is impressive work, and more than likely, yeah. it'll give you an excuse to go find your Android Wear watch and use it again for a week. And then, because I, I don't think yeah. <laughs> it, it, anything that lasts half a day, it's, you're just, no. Uh, I mean, you're, yeah. you're not going to be tether charging. I and mean, no. you got to take it off. God. It's no. a wristwatch. It's got to last at least a full day. Make it, I don't know, 18 hours, 20 hours, 24 hours. Just play it safe. Here's what I want. Make the battery last for 24 hours. Futurama Leela. I want... Give me like a yeah, 3,000 milliamp. Give me a full screen. Make it touch. <laughs> yes. And also make it, don't, don't, actually, I take that back. Make it fragile enough to where I won't use it as a weapon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so otherwise, I'd smack around everyone with it. Uh, we're about to get into Slice of Pie. We want to take a quick minute to thank the beautiful party patrons that are making this show possible. This show was a Patreon goal. You guys have helped us out, made it possible. Making two hundred and fifty dollars, wet sneaky caches every week, financing not this but a Tuesday stream. With Pedro, he was forcing yes. the business and bringing that on. The Canadians are going to back yes. on Thursday. They're going to be doing that with. Uh, they're invading Boston, right? That Boston <laughs> lockdown. And Friday, I'm going to be here for trivia <laughs> night. That's going to be a thing. Joe will be joining us. Uh, Yay! If you like our nonsense, <laughs> you want to help us out, or if you're currently helping us out. Thank you. You get a bunch of things. You get to hang out in our Discord chat, early access, custom feed for the audio, the pre-pre super shows. And if you want to listen to what we thought about Avengers, we spoiled the snot out of that last week, well, Saturday, and uh, access to our full uncut episodes. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for making this possible. Um, (laughs) I think uh, that's pretty good. We we should... uh, Yes. Well, no... (laughs) Come on, Pedro, to be like, oh, please give us money. No, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I could uh, perhaps uh, try to entice you with, uh, say, Support the promise page. of maybe doing a teeny tiny little merch run. See, Jill already uh, beat us <laughs> to the punch, and she's got her, uh, she managed to convince someone to offer her a uh, LWDW mug. <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Trademark Yay! infringement. I already <laughs> sent <laughs> Yay! Uh, but hey, if you'd uh, like something like that, uh, and you'd like to help us get to that uh, particular Patreon goal, <laughs> you can do that. Well, we were Just talking about, uh, before we went live, uh, definitely <laughs> looking, I'm currently looking to places to build our alpha site. 
an open studio. Yay! <laughs> so, so cool. The pre Kansas Kansas site is uh, Kansas is coming. Kansas Kansas Kansas. Listen, <laughs> yeah, the pre Kansas Kansas site. Listen, fam, it, it's called Kansas. <laughs> In Kansas, Kansas. Aww. That's the thing. We're, 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 we're going to do some baby steps with having a, a place where everyone can come over. And yes, it does have a bar on the roof. Uh, deal with it. Yes. Slice of pie, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Let's get into it. This is anything small, open source, and uh, pretty cool. Possibly a raspberry Pi paste. Yeah. Hit me with yeah. it. 1960. Okay, so the first one is a uh, touch pie. And well, uh, someone got themselves a 1960s console stereo, mm -hmm. and they wanted to bring it to the 21st century with a touchscreen. It's like, okay, all right, that uh, that's a good idea. How about the buttons, though? Are you just going to leave the buttons there as ornamental? And there it is in the video. He's using the buttons, and the buttons are working. You got me. Yeah, no, that's... that's, that's that, that, that was, was awesome. kind of meh at first, okay, and that wait, wait, right wait. there is... What type of person creates good. something like this? Like a hipster with an identity crisis? I mean... Yeah. What? <laughs> Someone with quite a great deal of time and resources on their hands. Yeah. <laughs> huh. That, well, I mean, I always like to see mechanical and uh, digital thrown together like that. That mm Hmm. hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he actually, um, there's a picture of just the buttons... On the teeny tiny PCBs to uh, show you the actuators of how they work. Mm -hmm. That is just genius. Well played. <laughs> All right, good times. Uh, That's awesome. Jill, you <laughs> tell us about yeah. mini pies. Yes. This this is the world's smallest pie gaming device using the Raspberry Pi Zero W. It's it's really cute. And Pedro even said it's about twice the length and width of a Lego minifigure. And um, it uses the Pico 8 game engine, uh, the same as in the pocket chip, because the dimensions of the screen are 120 by 120. So it has to be a game engine that supports that. And um, the, the article uh, talks about what he did to modify it and modify the, the, the buttons and the joystick and the, and the jog dial. So uh, he's, he's going to release eventually instructions on how he did it. <laughs> but it, it was just an amazing little project, and uh, Frostclaw in chat uh, brought this to our attention. Just, it was oh. really cool. <laughs> yeah, the... Why not? It's so tiny. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> it's uh, yeah. Ever it's so since cute. the the chip is gone now, mm -hmm. uh, this is a good alternative, and it's yeah. really not yeah. that much bigger. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I mean, just looking at that, any attempt, uh, it's already lost is what it is. I'm like, he, that, yes. That, that thing would disappear so hard in my house. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like, where did I put it? I just had it in my hand. Mm, right. Where is it? <laughs> okay, one more before we get out of here. Uh, Bash Project, Arthurian, one of our executive producers, sent this into our show notes. That's one to see we're horrible at plugging. That's something you get access to as a patron. Uh, <laughs> Bash Project Network Raspberry Pi Displays. If you have six displays laying around and seven Raspberry Pis, you can set this business up, man. I mean, you just need those gang of pies. Set one up as a master, and it feeds the video to the other six over Ethernet, which I thought, that's kind of cool. They didn't give any instructions on exactly how they set this up, though, but I, I was like, all right, yeah. that's neat. I kind of threw this in. Like, if anyone knows exactly how they did that, that could be useful for a video wall mm -hmm. display i oh, definitely. may or may not be interested in setting up so yeah yeah actually uh, i've done uh, digital signage so it, that, this is cool yeah. <laughs> admittedly my first thought now that's a cool hacky way to do it if you have to get my first thoughts like just buy a matrox card with like 12 inputs out on it yes and, yeah have all the heads mm -hmm. on it yeah. Like a third-hand <laughs> one that chances are is still going to work and it's going to output to all of those displays, no issues whatsoever. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but uh, using the Raspberry Pis, I'm pretty sure that seven Raspberry Pis uh, just playing a video on a loop or running a presentation or whatever you're using that particular uh, mosaic of monitors for, it's going to use less power than that Matrox card. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 
I, yeah. This is a good thing. I mean, as soon as you start, uh, I remember we were looking at the video signage from a bar I used to own. That anything customized like that just instantly goes to stupid pricing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And I mean, we're we're not even talking <laughs> like fancy video. We're just talking like LED scrolls that are programmable. I mean, These immediately. <clears> yeah, and the pedals are pretty cheap. It's <laughs> yeah. the software that you're paying for. Right. <laughs> the usability. Um, yeah. Hey, maybe you got some ideas, thoughts, hints, allegations. We got some stuff wrong. Maybe we got some stuff right. Maybe you got a question for us, uh, an idea, th- just. I don't know. Maybe you just want to write Pedro fanfic. How could they uh, go about doing that? Uh, well, you can go but about starting slower. yourself say, emotionally say, say for the rest of your life on LinuxGameCast.com by hitting the contact button and uh, submitting that as a, a bit of feedback mm-hmm. for LWDW. Make sure to pick that on the little drop downy box. Or some hate mail for the uh, Saturday show that I'm guessing it would be far more appropriate for that particular show or uh if you don't want to scar yourself emotionally uh you could ask jordan for relationship advice why not uh, i forget the name of the developer so i'm gonna get them mentioned on saturday's show but they oh i do want to mention this thanks I gotta if i don't follow you on twitter and you, you send me a dm it kind of goes into a separate folder from the main dms mm-hmm. from the people i follow don't get angry if I don't get back to you on those because I never checked that folder. I just happened to check it last night because I installed a new Twitter client because a regular Twitter client on my Android device is being a butt. Mm-hmm. And that's when I saw the game development company. They had said a thing and they're like, hey, guys, check this out. So I was like, hey, go to our contact page. I didn't give them instructions. I just said, go to our contact page. See if you can, I don't know, read. <laughs> because well, you got to send us three keys so we can all test it out in three different systems. And they did. And I was like, good on you. I just wanted to say, if I've not gotten back to you on Twitter and you've sent me a DM, peace out. It's not just at reply me in public and I'll get a notification about that. So um, we're not doing our job, Pedro. Mm, yeah, no, apparently not. Uh, so uh, Jolly uh, had a, a bit of a question. Dude, you promised my name in the credits. I was just catching up on my LGC and noticed uh, between Linux Gamecast Weekly 294, hurt me daddy, and uh, Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays 113, Con of the Penguin, um, a paragraph of names disappeared from the credits. Did I miss a memo somewhere? I hope you have a backup. You're just seeing things, man. <laughs> it just poofed. No, no one go back and confirm or deny that. You just uh, yeah. No, that that's definitely a thing. It's been sorted. It's like the semi-automated process we use for the CSV file that helps generate. Then I plug that in and record the credits each week. So something there was a glitch in the matrix. The it's been sorted. It wasn't a terrible Yay. Uh I just want to say I was kind of floored that somebody in the history of Evers watched one of our nonsense things <laughs> we do to the completion. I'm like, what? N- not just that, but they were paying attention. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it's terrifying. So it should be fixed. Everyone check out those credits and make sure I didn't miss anything. So uh, then I'll confirm that everything's working again. Uh, what do we have up next? Up next, we have some uh, startup uh, issues. Uh, so Diego is asking, hi, people. Uh, is there a way to make a reverse startup disk? Why would you decide to call it that? I flip it up short. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have my setup the way I like it and want to make a live USB out of it. Can this, can this be done? Yes. <clears throat> if yes. you... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you just want to make a live image and you can probably sort out the install or the copy on your own, uh, there are a couple of tools. There's Linux Respin uh, or Linux Live Kit. Though Those seem to be the two major ones that's, that people are using nowadays. There used to be uh, one called System Back, but that's no longer being actively developed. So your m- mileage may vary. How do these tools and... work? I've never given this any thought mm. is it like okay snapshot this and shove it on like a 16 or 32 gig drive or yeah something like that it uses squash fs to create an iso similar to how you have uh uh ubuntu live image or 
basically any distro's life now, image. Here's uh, a question also, though. Like, let's say you're using a live in. Is there a live image in creation that exists in 2018 that you can't already just customize and save? Eh, if you're burning it into a non-rewritable uh, media, yes. Why, why, but, but why this would is... you hate yourself? <laughs> I don't know. Well, this, <laughs> actually, I used to do used to do this um, uh, because it's it, it you know it saves all your your settings for all all the programs you're using. And if you have thousands mm -hmm. of programs installed, like I do when I'm doing animations and animations and whatnot, um, I've done this before. I've made snapshots um, on live disks. <laughs> well, I wouldn't do live. I mean, so, snapshots I get, or sync I yeah. get, DD I get. Yeah. Um, well, you could take it somewhere and uh, uh, show it to someone, uh, your, all your configurations. Actually, I did that once. I, I showed a student uh, how I had mine uh, set up. <laughs> so, okay, well, here, here's more questions. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to make it logical. <laughs> Say you needed to deploy and you didn't know about network deployment. Could you also, okay, if you'd modified your system image, made it bootable and usable, would it deploy that on a separate box? You could use it yeah. for that. Yes. Uh, Linux yeah. Respin uh, actually has an option to just for that. Um, honestly, I don't know because on my end, what I do is whenever I do a fresh install, I do all the basic configurations that I want, save that as a Clonezilla image, mm -hmm. and before I do any of the encryptions or anything else, I just save that as a Clonezilla image, then push it off to a uh, external hard drive and it sits there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, the, the last time I did it was with with Nopix. So that shows you how long ago it's been for the me. The last time I booted a <laughs> DVD or CD was, uh, get ready, because I'm not making this up, Hannah Montana Linux, because yeah. <laughs> it was the first distribution with a live version of Wayland on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was that was yeah. the thing that was like the one time I used my dual layer DVD burner in <laughs> yeah that thing's been up for years so it's been like six seven years ago <laughs> anyway ladies and gentlemen boys and girls it's been fun uh we're gonna bounce out of here we're about to pull the credits up because sure is not gonna get any better than what we delivered <laughs> come check out the Canadians tomorrow come check us out on the oh. game show Linux Gamecast Weekly? Yeah, we're still calling it that. Uh, that's going to be Saturday. <laughs> that's going to be the big thing. Uh, if you like weird, weird stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Until then, say bye to everyone. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> bye. Bye, bye everyone. <laughs> bye, chat realm. And Thank you, chat realm. Boom. <laughs> let's see if I get the credits right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Jolly? Jolly. Keep, keep an eye on your name. Or keep an eye out yeah. for your name. If I, if I was, if I had time to think about it, I would have just gotten all of our three names just wrong or something, or just. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think we got everyone in here now. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, oh, there and he is. I saw yeah. Jolly. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you, Foxy, for the PGP fail story. You posted it on Google Plus real quick. <laughs> See you next week. Bye, -bye. Bye chat room. Bye. <laughs>